Hey, did you know you can actually earn BACBCUs if you're listening to this episode? If you'd like to learn more, including about our Behavior Analyst Certification Board CEUs, that is continuing education units for people that hold the credentials by the BACB, you can go to explanatoryfiction.com and find this episode. Welcome to Explanatory Fiction. It's very important that you know how this podcast is structured. We've randomly generated this case. The variables are entirely fictional. That's right, because with the power of math and science, you can actually do these things now. In fact, the name Lily Frida is randomly generated too. And the episode art, you guessed it, also made by artificial intelligence. But the best part is our team is real and the conversations that ensue are designed as a game that you get to play along with us. In each episode, we have one person that is evaluating the case from a clinical decision-making model, and the others are accomplices of mine who are trying to stump the analyst. Our challenge to you is can you figure out a possible treatment model before us? Here we go. Lily is a seven-year-old girl who lives in Cordova, Tennessee with her parents and brother. She's been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder and anxiety disorder and received services in school for the past couple of years for each. You were contacted by her principal to do a classroom observation. So it's a Wednesday afternoon. You walk into Lemon Lake Elementary School. You notice she's in a specialized classroom when you walk in and you're greeted immediately by Miss Patsy. Hey, Dimitri, there's a seat for you in the back. I have my hands full with a pretty big class right now and instruction is already behind schedule. So I'm just gonna keep going. Um, Okay, so please get your 10 blocks. I need 10 blocks right in front. Lily, calm down. Lily, calm down. I need 10 blocks right in front of you. Please pull five blocks. Good, we have five blocks. We're starting with five. Are we doing addition or subtraction? Perfect. Lily, I can see you. Sit down, please. Miss Patsy continues to teach the rest of the class. You're sitting in the back and you notice occasional redirects and some uh, maladaptive behavior out of Lily. Lily one time gets up and reaches for her tablet at her uh, cubby. Lily, sit down now. Lily gets up, continues to grab her tablet and begins to put her headphones on. As Mandy approaches her desk to remove the tablet, you hear this. We can have tablet time at the end of the day if you're good, which we have not been so far. Manny removes the tablet and Lily begins to engage in intense verbal protests. A couple different words of yelling before getting out of her seat and aggressing towards a peer, Sally. This results in Mandy having to attend to the injured student while Lily gets her tablet out and begins to watch her favorite Lady Gaga music video. While another classmate, Fred, says, Miss Patsy, are you doing all right? Yeah, Fred, can you go get another teacher to come in here so I can get some ice for Sally, please? Next thing you know, Miss Patsy looks up at the clock and realizes the bell is about to ring, so she pauses and helps everyone gather the belongings and takes them out the door. On her way out, she says, I'm gonna be a little bit, so if you got anything else to do, you can go for it. So at this time, you decide I'm going to call one of the parents. You start by reaching out to Scott, Scott Frieda. You have reached the voicemail of Scott Frieda, phone number 854-333-1546. I'm sorry, the voicemail inbox you reached is currently full. Goodbye. I guess I'll try no. Hello? Hi, Noel. This is Dimitri. How are you doing today? Hi, Dimitri. I'm doing okay. Uh, I'm a behavior analyst. I was called in by the principal and given your information to call you to follow up about Lily. Um, She's been having some stuff going on in the classroom, and I was uh, hoping I could get some information from you. Um, We're just trying to see how she's doing and get an idea of maybe some things with her behavior and whatnot. Do you have a moment to talk? Yeah, I can talk. I I know that she's been having behaviors, but I didn't. I mean, yeah. Do, do what you gotta do. I didn't. Did know they not that. tell you that I was gonna be doing this? I don't recall hearing about that. I don't think. I don't think Scott told me either. Oh my goodness! Then I, I, I was under the impression they had already gotten consent. That was a condition of me joining uh, the classroom to come do that today. So um, I tell you what, I, just so that we don't waste time, uh, is, is it okay with you if we talk right now via the phone, and then I can go back with them and just double check to make sure they actually got the consent? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, they you they know, like, me to, to think that they had done that. I, you have my consent. You can, you can do what you got to do. Okay. That's okay. I just, this is the first I'm hearing of it. Okay. Well, maybe I should just give you a quick explanation on who I am and what I do. Yeah, sure. So you can kind of have an idea. So uh, my name is Dimitri McCready's. I'm a behavior analyst. Um, what behavior analysts do is we, we kind of show up and we work in schools and homes, all kinds of different kinds of settings. But for the most part, what we do is we, we go in and just kind of look at what people are doing, why they're doing it. And we try to set up systems to help 
incentivize more appropriate ways to interact in the environment and also teach particular kinds of skills that might be missing. So maybe social skills, or maybe in this case, some classroom readiness skills, classroom participation skills, maybe some social skills. So um, that's kind of what I do. And what I'm here to kind of help the principal and the teacher figure out is how to effectively put together a plan to, to get Lily a little bit more uh, engaged appropriately and integrated in the classroom. Yeah, that sounds great. I know they've been working on her on her behavior stuff. So yeah, Fantastic. Whatever, whatever you got. Okay. Well, let me ask you some questions. And if you don't mind here, tell yeah, me a little okay. bit about from your point of view, I'm assuming you already mentioned that you already know that she's been having some stuff going on in school. From your point of view, what are, what is the stuff? If you don't mind telling me what at like at school? Yeah, like what what is? Yeah, from what's your perception of how her behavior is at school and what it is exactly that she's doing? That's a problem. I just know that she has some tough days and like there's been some incident reports and stuff and you know sometimes I have to go pick her up because I work at night so I don't work during the day so I'm available to, to snag her when when I need to okay uh, and I haven't had a chance to review the incident reports so w what have been a, what have a couple of them been I think she just hit um, some other kid they don't write the other names but yeah I think she hit hit a different kid um, and they couldn't get her to calm down so I had to just come get her okay is this been is she have a history of doing this or is this kind of a new thing i don't know when that started to be honest like i'm it's kind of it seems like a school problem so i i'm i i just i don't know i know we're working on it but it's just it, it's kind of their issue to work out i can pick her up when i need to but yeah i mean do what you gotta do man okay <laughs> Um, well, no, I'll tell you what, let me get some basic background information about Lily and maybe that'll help us uh, spark our conversation a little bit better. Does she have any diagnoses, formal diagnoses? Yeah, she's, she, she has autism. Hey, okay. you know, any I'm, other? I'm sorry. I, I really thought this was going to be like a short call. Um, I am taking go? off here. I, I do, but I'm sure we can set something up. Okay. Before you leave, when do you think Scott might be available as well? Cause I called him in his voice boxes, his invoices. Well, he works during the day, so he'll, he'll probably be available. His inbox I don't know. Fine five o'clock uh yeah probably five okay well i'll tell you what since i can't leave him a message would you mind letting him know would you mind passing my number along and having him give me a call at his earliest convenience yeah sure that sounds really you look down at your phone in shock did he really just hang up on you as you look down you notice that it says call failed so you immediately try him back there's no luck in him picking up but as you're continuing on, driving down the road, you get another phone call and you realize it's from a number you recognize. You're pretty sure that it's the school. Hey, Dimitri, how's it going? I was wondering if you had any thoughts from your observation. I do have some thoughts, but before we get into that, I have to say I just had a uh, incredibly confusing phone call with uh, with Lily's dad, Noel. Okay. Um, and he wasn't very helpful, not in a negative way, and he did provide me at least verbal consent over the phone. Um, because he, but he, he was, it distressed me a little bit that he wasn't aware that I was coming into the case and that we were going to be doing what we were doing because I was under the impression that, you know, you guys had worked all that out. So I just want to confirm real quick before we get started that you had contacted them and that you do have consent for me to be here. Yeah. I think the principal also has it in writing, so I'm sure you could get that from him. Okay. Too. Okay. Okay. I, 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 I was, they gave me that impression. So I just figured that was the case. Um, so, okay. Well, why don't you tell me what's going on? Because, uh, I have to say I'm, I'm still a little, uh. I'm feeling a little bit, you know, confused on what the problems are here. Uh, I mean, I think you saw a good chunk of it. I mean, Lily is just pretty aggressive towards the other kids and that's really difficult to like follow up on with her. Um, when you say really aggressive, I I heard that she hit a kid and there was a, there was a slap or something. Is, is that happen regularly? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. That's about like pretty frequently throughout the day. I noticed that she wasn't necessarily pursuing that other kid. So what does it look like? What's the typical way that it looks like when she has an aggressive episode? It's usually more like when she wants something, she'll do that. Okay. And when she wants something, it's she just like, if, if she can't have it, she just like hits whoever's in her radius. Does she get up and pursue someone? How does it really look? Uh, yeah. what I saw just... wasn't very clear in terms of that. Yeah. It's more just like whoever is around her. I mean, she'll do what she needs to do to get what she wants. Okay. So if you, if let's just say someone wasn't in her, uh, the line of fire, if you will, would she mm -hmm. just like fall to the ground and complain or like have some emotional response 
or would she get up and pursue someone? I think I don't think she would get up and pursue someone. Okay. 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 Um, and how frequently have these episodes occurred? Like how, what rate? Um, it's happening every day. It's happening a few times a day. Oh, okay. So that is a problem, definitely. Great. So what else? What, what kind of things have you folks tried up until now? Hmm. I mean, I think we more just handle it on a case by case basis. So okay. I wouldn't say we've done anything super intentional. Okay. I mean, when we need help, I'll just request help. And it's mostly focused on the students she's injuring, not on her herself. Okay. So we're mostly just dealing with the fallout of the problem, not necessarily the problem itself, if I'm understanding what you're saying. Yeah, correct. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, I guess I'm a little confused what, what you folks want from me. Um, I mean, I'm really looking for any help that you can offer as I'm happy to do any of your suggestions. <clears throat> okay. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to offer some suggestions. One thing with the principal. So is the principal usually the person who responds to come and assist you when you do need that help or are there other people available that come in? Um, it's kind of just whoever's available, I would say. So, um, yeah, I'll pretty much just have to send one of my students to go get help for like a nearby teacher or whoever. Well, I got to be honest with you. I got a lot of stuff going through my head right now, and most of it is confusion. <laughs> um, there's definitely some things that we can talk about in terms of my basic observation. But usually in situations like this, we really gotta try to tackle the root of the problem. So, I mean, I can, I'd be more than happy to give you some, some superficial classroom management things that you can do uh, to deal with this issue based on what you're saying. It's happening more than, you know, once a day. And, and like that's a pretty good amount in terms of someone being aggressive towards another person. Um, but also given Lily's age and the severity of it, um, I don't think it's the biggest problem in the world in terms of like us being able to actually manage this with kind of some minor tweaks in the classroom. So um, I guess we can just talk about that if you'd like. Um, okay, let's start. I, I have to say, first things first, I would say I noticed that there was, and I'm going to say some things, by the way, and as I go through this, please know I'm here to help. I'm an outsider looking in. I understand that your job is impossible. So like, as I give you this feedback, please know that I am not judging you, nor am I thinking that you're a terrible teacher not doing a good job. These are just some, some highlight things that I'm seeing from someone who might just be caught up in a moment and feeling a certain sense of frustration and tension in something that is happening continuously and chronically in a way that is hitting you in a certain place. And you've maybe lost a little sight of the forest for the trees. And I'm just like to realign that a little bit. Okay. So, but so, so please hear me out with an open mind. <clears throat> okay. But the, okay. The first thing I would say is I think you got a little bit of a teacher tone going on. Sometimes I used to call this mom or daddy tone, depending on who I'm talking to. And that's a, that's a thing that we need to talk about intonation, direction, um, just how we talk to people in general. There's, there's other, it's not just the words we use. It's also the tone and the form of our, our words and, and the phrasing and all these things pitch that matters. And in some of these situations, it might, it might add to the chaos. It might add to the escalation. It might just add to the intensity of the circumstances. <clears throat> and if, if you break character like that a little bit, you, you, you show that frustration outwardly. And I have to say, I, I agree that it was a frustrating situation. Just so you know, I was laughing on the inside. Like, how is this person supposed to manage this amount of chaos? <clears throat> but that, that's one thing I would say is that I would, I would look at tone um, and try to readjust and maybe air a little bit more towards a neutral tone as you're, as you're putting your directives out. Okay. The second thing I would say is maybe we should look at formalizing your classroom structure a little bit. Um, I noticed that you had some very clear cut activities going on, which is kind of, which is great. Um, what does your lesson planning look like? Like, how do you, how do you go about creating your lesson planning on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, so we're pretty set around a schedule. So each, I mean, each block looks a little bit different, obviously, but you observe math. So that starts with a warm up, and then we do a review and then we get into the actual lesson. So that's the, I do, we do, you do part. And then they have independent practice for a little bit. Awesome. And what's, what time, like what size blocks are you doing that in? About 30 minutes. Okay. Are you now, obviously we're seeing that that 30 minute block might be a little bit too long for everybody in the group, especially for Lily. Would you consider maybe temporarily shrinking that down maybe 50% to 15 minute blocks and then maybe setting it up on like a, some kind of escalating criteria that we can put where you can scaffold back into that 30 minute period um, just to get some momentum and some control back in? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> control is the number one thing that I want in the classroom. Okay, cool. Okay. Because here's what I think is going on. It, it, if it is related to she wants what she wants when she wants it, um, she, I mean, she can communicate, um, obviously, but she wants what she wants what she wants, regardless of her communication skills. So that means that we have a couple different things in front of us. Number one is we can just keep pushing and try to impose our will, which is not working. It's backfiring. Or we can kind of set up a situation where she can more readily access the things she wants on a, on a little bit faster pace. And then we could just wean her off of that over time, giving us the control that we need. I'm thinking the 15 minute blocks is a good shot. Normally we would take some measures and try to figure out a better precise timeline for that. But given that it's only happening a couple times a day, I'm thinking that if we just shrink down the blocks, build a really good amount of momentum and get a lot of successful opportunities, then over time, um, we'll just be able to extend that without having to deal with too many technical aspects of it. Again, if we go through this and it backfires, we can we can revisit it. But my, my thoughts are we, we, we shrink down to that 15 minute block. We create uh, opportunities for her to earn some things. One thing that she said she wanted, what was the thing that she said she was working for again at the end of the day? Uh, she really likes her iPad and her Lady Gaga time. Love it. Okay. So my thoughts are maybe we leverage that for a couple minutes after each of those blocks. And then you can have it present so you can entice her so that she knows it's there for her to earn. And at the end of that block, you're just like, hey, if she if she finishes strong, you just shove it in her face and give it to her without even going to ask for it. And then you can, that'll even give you an opportunity to start building like, hey, my turn, your turn too. You can start working on sharing while you're doing that. So set a timer, give her a minute or two. Let's just say two minutes so that it makes sense and it's, it's concrete. She gets her little two minutes with that little, with her situation. Yeah, you say my turn, you pull it, you go back into the work, 15 minutes and back. And let's just say we do that three, four, five days. I think we could just work out a good solid timeline and then add five minutes to that block every say five days till you get back to your 30 and kind of see how that goes. If we plateau at a certain point, <clears throat> that'll give us a pretty good indication of kind of where her hard line is. But I'm thinking this is really just a matter of relationship building and just reteaching her the game of back and forth and that, you know, she gets stuff. She just doesn't have to wait all day for it. And that you are the giver of the goods. Um, Cause we really just need to work on your relationship building. Like I said, and I think it's just a matter of the situation, but I think a combination of, of just the dynamics in the classroom and stuff. I think we just also need to make it fun for you again, because I can only imagine that your job is probably feeling a little bit like a, like a dredge and maybe this will give you break up your day a little bit too. Yeah. If we do that sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. So those are really my suggestions. Very simple, minor tweaks. I don't, I don't think we need to do too many global stuff here. Um, but that, that's where I would go. It, yeah, does that make sense? Any questions about what I just said? Um, no, that does make sense. I am looking forward to you coming back. Would okay. you be available for another observation next week? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. Okay. That'll give that'll give you a full week of giving it a run too, yeah. and then we can come back and see if it backfires or if it works for us. Perfect. Lovely. See you then. So next week you come in to Lemon Lakes Elementary School for your second and follow up observation. Miss Patsy welcomes you right through the door. All right, everyone, go ahead and get out your news to you. Today's topic, we are going to get ready for the summer. So our schedule is going to go like this. We are going to do our reading together. Then you are going to answer the questions on your own. And then we are going to review them. We are only going to do this for about 15 minutes. So Lily, as soon as we have done those three things, you will get your iPad. Sound good? Okay, awesome. All right, do you guys like to swim? There's a new water park opening in Orlando. So Lily begins to show some signs of agitation during the work schedule. And Mandy's making sure to follow the behavior plan that you described, Dimitri. Ensuring high fidelity and high quality attention is actually being provided as well. Lily gets up though and begins to make a beeline towards the door. When Mandy blocks and redirects, Lily turns around and aggresses towards Sally. And as Mandy responds, Lily elopes out of the room. Dimitri, this is the third time this week that she's targeted Sally. And I feel like we're seeing improvement in the classroom, but something's not clicking. Um, we have a meeting set up with her parents, but I mean, do you think you could call, maybe observe at home, something like that? <laughs> I would love to do that. Unfortunately, I uh, had an opportunity to speak with Noel over the phone and, uh, not optimistic I'm going to be able to catch him and uh, Scott never returned my call. So I'll tell you what, why don't we just meet with them together and then we'll try to pin them down then in person just to avoid the, uh, the, the, the call back and forth, the, you know, the, the phone tag. Okay. All right, Dimitri, on your way out, all of a sudden you're walking through the door and you bump into 
Scott, are you Dimitri? Uh, yes. And who are you, sir? Oh, I actually heard a lot about you from Noel. He said you guys had a great talk the other day. Noel, and your name is? Scott. Okay. Oh, Scott. Scott. Scott Freda. Yes, yes. You're Lily's dad. Yes. <clears throat> Lovely. Nice to meet you, man. I, I saw that you just called me. I was on my way out talking to principal. I didn't have a chance to answer. Yeah, sorry. I got a, a real busy schedule. I get it. I get it. Life's, uh, life's wild like that. Um, just got done talking with uh, Miss Patsy, and she said that we have a meeting tomorrow. So I was I was just figured we catch up then. Um, is that gonna work for you guys? I was I was actually coming by to tell uh, <laughs> Miss Patsy that uh, we we got to cancel. Oh my! What's what's going on? Uh, well, Noel's got this thing going on at work, and I gotta watch Lily at home. Oh okay. Oh my. Well, I mean, you guys are more than welcome to make your decisions as you choose. I will say that uh, her behavior is escalating. And um, one of you is going to be staying home a lot longer if uh, if we probably don't do something about this sooner or later. Because, you know, if I were the school, I'd be really concerned about her behavior. And, and you know, th- they might at some point need to explore some alternative opportunities. So you might want to reconsider your, that. Yeah, I, I know. I just um, there's been s- some stuff going on at home with her behavior, too. It's just been kind of off the wall. Like Noel and I are, are not getting any sleep uh, trying to. Uh, um, oh, really? Yeah, it's so they, uh, her and her sibling just go back and forth all. I'll tell you what, Scott. Let me put a pin in that real quick. Okay. Um, you know, we're sitting here right here. I know that you're here to pick up Lily. Why don't we do this? Why don't we just go see if we can grab Miss Patsy real quick for a quick ten minute, tu- a quick, uh, quick ten minute touch base, and then maybe we can get enough information information to move forward so we don't have to have the meeting tomorrow. What do you think about that? I mean, could we possibly like just? I mean. The principal was raving about you, um, so I was, I was kind of hoping you could maybe come to a home observation. Oh, I'd be happy to do that. Sure. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm really mm-hmm. sorry we have to cancel today. Um, it's uh, uh, I mean, it, once you see it, at what it, what's going on at home, it's just um, okay. I, I hope you'll understand. Sure. I, I'm really sorry. When would be a good day then in the next few days? Uh, does tomorrow work for you? Let me look at my calendar here one second. I'm sorry. You know, tomorrow's kind of tight. Um, what about the day after? Uh, perfect. Okay. Just, just give me a call when you're there and I'll come open the door for you. Um, I will do my best. Uh, Hey, I don't know if you know this, but your inbox is full. So may want to check that a little bit. Um, okay. But, uh, yeah. Cool. I'll give you a call when I get there. Okay. All right, Dimitri. So you roll up to this, uh, nice little suburban area, right? And as instructed, before you head in and knock on the door, you give Scott a call. Uh, Dimitri, I see, I see you out there. Scott, come what's on. up, man? Hey, not a whole lot. Hey, thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. You want to come on in real quick? Absolutely. Awesome. Come on in. So as you enter the room, you hear a verbal argument break out between Lily and her brother, Jarrett. Lily, Jarrett, leave each other alone. You peek around Scott's head and you see Jarrett and Lily still looking at each other, clearly upset. They start to bicker again when Scott turns around and... Don't make me come over there. Lily begins taking the magnetiles out of Jarrett's hands. Jarrett turns away and says, it's mine. And Lily takes a few of the magnetiles and runs to her room. You need to stay in your room and give me back those magnetiles now. Noel walks into the room to tend to Jarrett while Scott goes to manage Lily. In the meantime, Lily opens the door and grabs one of the magnetiles laying just outside that Scott missed. You are in big trouble. And what did I say about those tiles? So the situation continues as you're talking with Scott, who is in and out of conversation with you as he keeps a close eye on Lily's door. Meanwhile, Noel's full attention has been towards Jarrett. You need to stay in your room. You shouldn't have taken those tiles, Lily. Jarrett, I am so sorry. Hey, we know how Lily can get, right? We, we can go get some ice cream later, like just just you and me. Well, you wanna go watch some Bluey? We can go watch some Bluey. Jarrett says, I'm definitely gonna get her next time I see her. Those tiles are mine. As Lily's peeking out of the room, Jarrett rushes over uh, to her with an open hand, strikes her across the face, and Lily starts crying. Scott stops demanding the magnet tiles, and Noel tells Jarrett, That was not nice and he needs to go to timeout, which he does in tears, but without any pushback. The dust settles and Dimitri has an opportunity to talk with the parents without an eruption now. Uh, Hi. Hey, uh, sorry about that. I, um, I, I think we're in the clear now. I, uh, I told you it's been crazy. Yeah, that's, uh, it's a lot to take in. Thank you for, uh, having me. Uh, 
is it cool? For, is it okay if we just, is there somewhere to sit here or you guys want to talk here in the hallway? You know, we, we can go over and, and sit in the living room. It's, it's nice to see you. Sorry. You caught me as I was driving behind some mountains and we just, we got You're disconnected. Good. No um, problem. Yeah. Hey, no, no offense taken. I, sure. to- Hey, I totally get it. I, I just saw, you know, that was a great example. Honestly, I'm glad I got a chance to see what just happened there. Um, You know, Jared kind of hit her, but she kind of instigated the whole thing and it was a whole back and forth. And it seems like you guys are, is that a, is that a common thing that happens on the regular? Or are you guys seeing that all the time? Um, well, S- Scott usually takes care of things when they get that pumped up with Lily. So she, she listens to him most of the time. So I'm I'm usually checking in with with Jarrett because it, it can be pretty upsetting for him. I see. So you're kind of like dividing and conquering here. Like you kind of go in and help parent and take care of the situation with Jared. He steps in with Lily and then you guys hopefully come back together after an episode like that and just kind of hopefully have patched things up. Yeah, yeah. When we're both here, it, it works out pretty well that way most most okay. days. And when you're not both here, what's it look? What's how's it work out? Uh, I mean, Jared's pretty pretty with it, so we can we can send him off with some toys, and you know, like I I can try to tell I can give Lily her her iPad or some music or things to calm down and and send her off to. So I it, I guess it's that same kind of separate and 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 get them back <laughs> down to like a, a chiller spot. How, how old is Jared again? He's three. Okay. Okay, so he's a little guy. Yeah, he's he's, he's pretty little. <laughs> okay, um, um, he's uh, I mean, uh, he's been a lot recently. He uh, he wasn't always like this. Um, it's really just been ever since Lily's been targeting him. I mean, he just reaches his his limit. Um, so, um, so you, you guys recognize that the problem really is obviously it's not okay that he hits her, but. The reality is a three-year-old is going to respond very viscerally to another child kind of, you know, taking things from them and not sharing and, and whatnot. So like that, you that's kind of your point of view and take on the situation. Am I reading that right? Yeah. He, yeah. He's been enjoying like us working on rules a lot and stuff like that. Like he likes being the little helper right now, which is, which is pretty nice. I know I have a three and a, I have a three and a half year old. It's uh, they're, they're the best people in the world when they want to be but they're also the worst people in the world when they want to be so it's a it's a beautiful balance you get to watch and witness I, i'm with you right there right behind you um <clears throat> okay do you mind if we just go through some some factors here just so i can have a, a full picture of what lily's situation is we talked um no you told me on the phone that she had just a straight autism diagnosis and i kind of lost you from there we, we got cut off could you walk me through some other factors is she currently receiving any therapies uh no she's not okay is she uh, on any kind of medications or anything like that for her behavior? Uh, no, no. Okay. Um, any changes recently in, in her environment or anything like that? Uh, I mean, new school, but uh, I mean, it's same kind of like classroom layout. Um, I mean, it's really been since Jared started, uh, talking and moving around a bit more. And honestly, I mean, now that Jared shares the same interests as Lily, uh, it's like all of Jared's toys are now Lily's toys. Okay. I see. So we're maybe having some of that young sibling rivalry, sibling rivalry emerging already. (laughs) Oh yeah. I mean, I, I, I squash it pretty quick. I'm a, I'm pretty old school when it comes to uh, uh, how we do stuff here. So, uh, I mean, Lily gets a timeout. Um, oh, she gets a timeout. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it, it can last a while uh, just because she just keeps keeps adding time to it. Um, when you say she keeps adding time, what is she, how long is the original timeout? I mean, the original timeout is like, uh, like we usually start with like 10 minutes. And where does she go? Into her room. Does her room have a bunch of stuff in it? Um, well, we end up, we've, we've taken most of the stuff out now cause she kept playing with it and I told her not to play with it and then she did. And so I added more time and then I took the item out and now the, uh, her room is her bed. So if she's in her, her room dresser. in time out with nothing really in there, what can she possibly be doing to be adding time? Uh, I mean, you saw her just poke her head out the window, steal that extra magnet tile. I told her not to. Oh, so she was in time out right then and there. I mean, yeah. I told her to go to her room. She knows. Yeah. So okay. go to your room. I didn't say time out, but so how old I is mean, she again? I, I missed. Uh, am I missing? Some, how she is uh, se- seven, seven, right? Okay. Yeah, birthday last month. Okay. Yeah. Cause she's okay. I'm just trying to figure out. I was like, I wasn't sure we we're talking about a teenager or something. Um, okay. Um, well, I mean, 
do you folks feel like you have a good handle on this? Uh, no, that's yeah. why I came and talked to you yesterday. I know, I know, I, I understand that. I'm sorry. It was more of a rhetorical question to really gauge whether or not we're going to engage on this process together because there's a lot of things going on just from witnessing your family dynamic and I'm incredibly concerned. Yeah. So I just wanted to make sure that we're on the same page and you folks really want to move forward um, because we're, we're, this is going to require a full degree of engagement and attention in order to do that. And it's going to be very difficult if we uh, have sporadic opportunities to interact. Uh I mean, oh, are you talking about my phone thing? Just in general, you know, just in general. I or is just it, or is it sure we'll it here together? Uh, I mean, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, the, so let's just agree on what the problem is so that we can make sure. that. So the problem is, is that Lily wants what she wants when she wants it. She's ex- exhibiting some pretty typical childhood jealousy of an older sibling to their smaller sibling. Um, and then that er, that usually starts as a scenario where... He's playing with something that she might have not even playing with, but because he's got it now, she wants it. So she goes and takes it. She goes and takes it. And that creates a tug of war that then brings you folks into the equation where you're trying to break up the scene and corral everyone back to their corners. In which case, uh, that usually results in Jared maybe lashing out at her, in which case that continues to escalate. And at that point in time, you finally separate them. Somebody goes in timeout. Someone goes and gets a talking to. And then 10, 15, 20 minutes later, we come back out of our corners and we restart the process. We might get a certain amount of period of time of peace in between. Have I read that approximately in a reasonable, uh, within a reasonable framing? Yeah, that's been our life for the last few weeks. Yeah. Sweet. Sweet. Do you like living like that? I mean, you tell me, man. Yeah. I mean, dude, I, it sounds horrible to me. That's why I want to make sure that we're on the same page here because we, we can fix this. Page. We can fix this and I can help you. But I mean, like. We have to be very clear about the fact that this is not a good way to live. Oh, yeah. I okay. mean, I don't disagree. All right. Uh, no, you're, you're really going to strain. No. So I'm going to ask you, are, I mean, what, am I, is that congruent with your perception of the situation or not? No, I, I guess that's <laughs> it, it. We're doing the best we can. I mean, but it, it. I'm on board for what it's going to take. I just, it can get physical and I don't like my kids hitting each other. So we're just trying to fix the problem when it happens. We're just responding to what we're seeing. No, I can tell from your tone of voice that you just feel so much about this and it's hard to watch your kids do this. So um, I'm really sorry if I feel like I'm pushing you here and I'm not trying to minimize the reality of it. You guys are really are doing your best. And who am I to come in here and tell you you're not doing a good job? You're doing your, your kids are wonderful. They live in an obviously beautiful, happy home. They have parents who love them. They have all the privileges and anything that anyone could ever want. I think what you're just missing here is maybe some uh, some necessary boundaries um, and uh, some just some very clear cut rules and expectations to kind of help set the stage to put you folks back in the driver's seat, um, especially for kids this age, being as young as they are, and with Lily maybe having a little bit of a challenges and picking up on social cues and and participating in that that the social enterprise of your home um so i i hope that you didn't take what i was saying before in offense because that wasn't my intention it was more just to point out that you know there is definitely a problem here that needs that needs to be addressed no i i think we agree that there's a problem to be addressed it's just okay you you get buried in it you know Man, I'll tell you what, if, if, if someone had warned me how hard parenting was when I became a parent, I'm not sure I would have done it. It's the best thing in the world, the best thing that ever happened to me. And I, I obviously I wouldn't actually do it, but the task is daunting. So I can, I, I can only imagine what it's like with, with a kid with a disability too, on top of that. So, okay, well, let's start breaking this thing down then a little bit. Okay. Um, the first thing I would say is we should probably talk about the timeout. And we should probably talk about the overarching just situation. Should it be longer? <laughs> Scott, I'm not going to lie. I love your energy. I love it. You sound a lot like my dad back in the day. It's awesome. Well, you turned out good, so. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but after years of therapy, my friend, and self-reflection. So, so I don't like, know if you want, uh, I don't know if you want that to go that the road for your kid. I think we can do it without having to have a, so much uh, work to be done as an adult. What do you, what, what do you say? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I gotta be honest. I'm not a fan of this, uh, touchy feely stuff, new age, hippy dippy, uh, <laughs> Scott, I'm gonna, I've seen some of these things that these schools are trying to do. And, Look, I, and, and Scott, I, I, I tell you what, let me put you like this. I, I, let me be very clear about who I am and what I do. 
I'm not here to do hippy dippy weird new age stuff with you. I'm a scientist. Okay. I just, I look at things very objectively and I look at things in terms of relations, a person's relations to the environment, the things, everything around them, their, their dynamics with other people. And we look to restructure the way they interact with those things in a way that kind of funnels them like a mouse through a maze. So I'll tell you what, you'll probably like me characterizing it this way if you're old school. Our job is to build a cert, a, a perfect mouse mouse maze for your kid to walk through so that we funnel her out and the end point is being a good person and not being a person who demands what they want when they want it. Uh, I mean, I can, get, I can get behind that besides... Uh, yeah, I can get behind that. Yeah, I figured you could. You know, and the thing a about mouse the, maze, though, is an analogy. Hey, man, you're the one who said you were old school and you like it old school. I'm just trying to give you the, the most clear cut way that we can look at this. Yes. Some of the original research for what we do started out with mice and rats. So, yeah. Well, I don't know what kind of research you do. I just know that you compared my daughter to a mouse. I mean, they're majestic creatures. I don't know what to tell you. They are. You're right. Okay. All right. Wonderful. <clears throat> okay. So let's start with the timeout. I don't think it's productive, not because I don't think that you shouldn't be allowed to punish your kid or maybe your kid's not doing stuff that, you know, leads you to think that she needs to be punished. What I would say is, is that there might be some ways for us to tackle this a little bit up front so you can intervene before things get bad and, and, and you have to deal with it that way. The other thing is we need to talk about is kind of like the, the dynamic and the relationship between the two kids she's obviously very protective of her stuff and she doesn't want him to be able to touch her things, etc. And you even said that Jared does, you know, uh, go to her things very clearly. Um, so that's an, another aspect that we should probably tackle. The other things are just going to be about honestly, and don't take offense to this kind of your tone and the way that you react to things. Who? No. I mean, I know he's a bit of a pushover, but wow. I love your energy, Scott. I really do. I think you're fantastic. I was actually talking about you, my man. Sure. Okay. <laughs> well, well, hold on. It's the, instead of yes and me, well, why do you think I would say that? Say what? That I, that I want to talk about maybe your reaction to stuff. I mean, I, I don't think you like the way I do things in my house. Listen, I'm being frank. I have no opinion on the goodness or badness of what you do in your house. My opinion is on the effect that it has on your kid and your ability to do it, instructionally control them or in, in direct them to where you need them to go. I am not making a moral judgment. I'm making a judgment of efficacy. I guess, let me rephrase the question to you so you don't feel like I'm judging you because I promise you I'm not. Is what you're doing working? It's not. Okay. So you seem like a really practical guy. So you, you tell me, if things aren't working, well, should you do them over and over again? I mean, it's... The definition of insanity okay i'm just saying man i'm here for you if you don't want me it's fine i'm I really it's i'm not here to um, shove anything down your throat but i'm just trying to help you come to realization that like listen if we want different results we got to do different things all right all right i'll, I'll give it a shot but if it <clears throat> if it gets too hippy dippy you're out i'm out okay no problem i'm again it's your family your child you make choices along the way you can withdraw consent at any time and choose not to participate. I am simply here on a consultative basis and I'm making suggestions. Cool. Okay. How much further no, are we... you in? Uh, no, I'm, I'm open. I mean, we, we've talked about this. I, I just want our kids to get along and for it to be calm. Cool. Yeah, let's do it, man. All right, man. That's fantastic. If you've been falling through on season one, this is going to be a little bit of a curveball. So Dimitri sits down with the parents and outlines a treatment plan and gets consensus and gets him on board. He follows up a few weeks later and it turns out that everyone's still working well on the plan, implementing things correctly, and Lily's actually doing fantastic. Hey, Dimitri, I just wanted to say how well Lily is doing. It is like night and day. I just would love to know more about what you did to help this student. It's crazy. You made it. This is the point in which you can pause, think about what you maybe would have done differently. Think of if there's any themes throughout this as well. We're going to break character here and this just turns into a typical podcast where it's just an open discussion. I hope you enjoy. So, I mean, when writing this episode, a big thing that um, we were trying to uh, tease in was clearly uh, the need for parent involvement. Um, I mean, if you're seeing these behaviors across different um, 
context and settings, then there's uh, uh, limited opportunities for success when you're only targeting it in one. And uh, that was why we kind of the parents be not involved. Or the root issue might just be in a totally different environment than where you started, right? Too, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Any thoughts, Dimitri? Thoughts? (laughs) Or Dave? Or Abby? (laughs) I mean, Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I, Okay. Did you was, did you get the that sense was that the problem? First question. My first question was what was the what was the purpose of the episode? But I, I that was what I figured was the problem. Did you yeah, pick up was, on that pretty quickly? Um, once we I got mean, to that state, or was it too poorly written? <laughs> no, it was well written. It's pretty obvious there was a disconnect, and the, and uh, the, an underlying theme of this episode was going to be disengaged parents and or overwhelmed parents just wasn't sure which way it was going to go until I got to that point in the story. Uh, I, was, I had, I had a figure, I figured it was going to be a parent buy-in situation and a getting them to do it situation. Was it, I was, was it just really excited. This, was it this part of the story? You have reached the voicemail of Scott Frieda, phone number eight, five, four, three, 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 four, uh, five, that, four, okay. Six. That was definitely an, an initial indicator, but then the mountain disconnect and I got to go was, uh, confirmation that Pretty this was going signal. to be annoying. What I actually did was visualize myself actually in that situation in real life and I was emotionally preparing myself to never talk to those people again. <laughs> <laughs> Very candidly. Yeah, that there wasn't going to be a, a path for you to uh, talk to them again before you laid out a treatment plan for, for Mandy because part of the fun was setting up a plan that failed. Still failed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you still, if if you get cut off, if parents are as disconnected as as we were in the beginning of this, what's the follow through look like with with Mandy, Patsy, and the school scenario? In your opinion, that point in time, we try to set up as many contingencies as we can. Um, we'll probably institute a crisis plan along with the behavior plan, so we can manage the behavior effectively. Minimize that. I'd probably separate her and maintain a certain distance from peers at all time. That kind of a thing. As if it, and then we just let nature take its course. I mean, it'll either escalate or not. There's not, uh, you know, then, then that means, okay, once it escalates, the next stage is, okay, do we assign a one-on-one and you know, that fails and you know, it just escalates from there. The phases are classroom management system, general preventatives, small minor consequential interventions, little reinforcements here or that, you know, minimizing work blocks, that kind of a thing, maybe a little bit of FCT, but not from a communicative point of view, but more in terms of like a separation point of view to get the social engagement. And once it escalates, you go to that one-on-one, then you start talking about if that feels miserably, you know, they'll go to home instruction. They'll do, they'll pull the ripcord. Schools are not, they don't play. So um, the, the that's honestly why my initial very blunt interaction with Scott at the door was just foreshadowing and trying to uh well, you laid it all out there you trying to be you very what, clear yeah. that your decisions to not participate are going to have explicit consequences for your kids should we not be able to have the effect that we need and me not being able to get access to you to get the information necessary for me to make an appropriate recommendation only limiting what's possible and i'm not taking responsibility for that because you're avoiding me School staff are a lot more familiar with that process than parents, especially if it's your older child. So they might not know what the other avenues that that school systems may have or what might come down the pipeline if it's unsuccessfully managed at school or addressed at school. I agree. I mean, I think it's a very good and we kind of mentioned this in a a, a previous episode, but it's a very good tool at your disposal to talk people through, especially if you have people that are disengaged, walk them through what the future looks like over time should they continue down their road and give them a layout of what the consequences of their decisions. How about informed consent, man? My thing is consent. I will bend over backwards for people who are willing to participate in the process and are there to do that. But I see disengagement as a withdrawal of consent, of assent. And if I don't see that, then there, there's no realistic avenue towards efficacy. So there's no necessary... That I should allocate to this thing because we have a we play a resource allocation game as well, and there is an oversupply of people who need our help. And if people aren't don't want it, then don't get it. And digging in the depths of of YouTube, is there like an inventory that you know of that shows what high magnitude behaviors and adults can look like out and about? Like, I don't think that there's like scare tactics, but like as a society, 
He does a good job of keeping those of, of those kinds of individuals hedged into buildings where they are not exposed to the general public too much. So other than like banking on our words and our professional opinions, like how would individuals who have just found out that their kid has an autism diagnosis or not not to like include scare tactics, but can do they if aren't exposed to what that could what what problem topographies can look like in adults? What does opening that up look like other than just word of mouth? I mean, I th- I think um, conversation with families about problem behavior when when the client is younger and uh, the manageability of those situations in that moment versus uh, what they hormones. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Years. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I think sometimes when you're you're lost in that chaos, it's hard to see the long term, and you're just going through the day to day of this. Um, maladaptive behavior is being uh we're resolving it like this and this is what we're doing now and i'm not even thinking about how bad it's going to be 10 years from now because i just hope we're not there anymore i mean one of our hallmarks is social significance so we have the benefit of looking at what that looks like down the line but i'm yeah i that i haven't really thought of it till now it's just other than banking on our words of someone you might just you might have just met how can we expose or or begin the process of showing what that pipeline can look like without intervention. I'm sure if that's necessary, to be honest with you, I don't know if that's your responsibility. I, 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 go ahead. I would think that, I mean, at least the way that I would do it is look at it as it pertains to the topography of the client that we're about where it's like, look, they are doing this X, Y, and Z now. And um, if Rather than having just kind of a list of things that we put out where it's like, this could happen. It's like, if this exact behavior that we're seeing now is occurring when this child is 20, um, it's, it's a whole new. But the question was, how, how do you get people who are in denial or assume that they'll grow out of it? Because mindset, right? The mindset of this is just childhood stuff and they'll sure. grow out of it. So yeah. why am I worried about a thing that they're going to grow out of? So they assume natural suppression that'll happen over time with maturity with explicit instruction. We know that in these many of these situations without explicit instruction, you don't necessarily see that happening. You see it exaggerate, exacerbate and exaggerate instead of adolescence. Even the way that ind- individuals react initially can start strengthening that response or leading to even new variations of that. Sorry, Ryan, go ahead. What were you going to say? You're good. I've got uh, actually some related literature that I read up on years ago. Um, Rice 2003, trying to identify certain variables that will influence the adoption of certain innovations. So this isn't a perfect correlate to what we're talking about, but it's it's got a few notable things in here. Uh, if you're trying to get someone to basically adopt something, the innovation or the solution needs to solve an important problem for the client. I think that's what we're trying to talk about here. The innovation must have relative advantage over current practice or what's currently going on in the environment. The person championing the innovation must be seen as credible by the client. Interesting one. And then the innovation must be compatible with existing values, experiences, and the needs of the intended audience. On that that anchored off of those four things would get more movement in these sort of skill sets from people. Translates to perspective okay. taking what like you're talking one? to. What was the first one again? The innovation is, so it has to actually solve the problem. It needs to be effective. But okay, the point so is, is just because it's effective. Yeah. Hold on, let's go through what we did. Cool. We would, we designed a, we were, we were in the process of designing a functionally equivalent intervention, which theoretically would be effective. Step one, step two, what was the step two now? To have a relative advantage over the current practice or the things that are in play in the environment currently. So part of selling this is pointing out how everything that Scott was doing, despite him being old school and declaring himself a person who can, you know, whatever, that's just his disposition, his cultural point of view, whatever those things may bar, regardless of that, failing. So then the question was, do you want an alternative that will not fail you? So pointing that out to create the buy-in. So that's step two. Step three. The person championing the innovation must be seen as credible by the client. So how do you establish credibility with a person? Well, honestly, a lot of the things that I've been trying to showcase in terms of me either be being willing to walk away, shutting things down, being overtly direct and blunt at times, <clears throat> putting people on task and track, calling out 
misinterpretations or all these things like it's not establishing credibility because you can't claim or be conceived of as an authority you aren't direct honest and to the point about what you're trying to accomplish it uh, you know and actually there's a couple of different um and we mentioned this guy before chris voss a guy who does negotiation tactics or whatever like he's a former fbi terrorism negotiator and, and he has written a book called never split the difference it's pretty pretty great but it had a chance to read it five or six years ago and I've, I've revisited it once or twice since establishing credibility is saying what you mean and mean what you're saying what you're saying and there's a general disconnect with that and how helping practitioners actually do their jobs on a day-to-day -day basis where we feed into a lot of the misinterpretations and stuff as in like we're just here to support we're just here to support we're just here to support that's a miss you know being here to support does not mean being here to validate your delusion or misinterpretation that's leading to you being in denial here to support is being here to support you and finding a solution to the problem that you have come here to help get solved be able to focus on that so being able to number one continually redirect to the problem two being able to point out and be able to demonstrate that your observation skills are keen enough to identify that they're not going the way they need to be going and being willing to say i'd be happy to help you if and only if you want my help and be willing to walk away also pretty good at uh making yourself relatable with the parents too when you bring up your own child a few times there too right like that's creating some credibility of like listen i understand this perspective a little bit right yeah and what comes I up every Noel episode was a temp check so with noel damage his body language slouched his tone got soft and you could hear a little bit of the, the hurt or just like concern or just like defeat in his voice. What you want to do is it's a good part of like empathetic responding is being able to call out people's responses and emote with them without necessarily getting into their heads. And that that shows that you are that you are tuning into what they've got going on. You're recognizing it. You're considering it It's part of how your interaction is going to be structured. And that helps them kind of soften and be seen. We talk a lot about how, you know, it's important to see people. How do you, well, the best way to get to a person that you're seeing them, being able to very effectively call out their state of mind or state of emotion, their emotional state in a particular moment, especially in instances of distress. And the second that you're able to do that and tact it out loud, you immediately help diffuse the situation and pull some of that stress out of them because now it's out in the open and you're there with them in a non-judgmental way to support them in being able to be feel that the exposure without the discomfort of what it is to be exposed. It's almost helping them identify their MO for how we're going to make behavior change happen and how we can help provide reinforcement. You know what Absolutely. I mean? You identify Absolutely. the need and then we're going to point them in the direction of, of how we're going to fix it or how they're going to fix it. Absolutely. And what was the fourth one then? Right. Fourth one was the innovation must be compatible with the existing values, experiences, and the needs of the intended audience. There you go. So it was like, what is the thing that you value the most here? What do you guys actually want? Familial harmony. We want our kids to be successful. We want all these beautiful things for our family. You know, that's their values. Their real values. The, they're, they're posturing. There's always going to be posturing in any conversation, right? People are going to have a projected self or, you know, whatever thing that, whatever mask they're wearing in that given instance. Scott's mask was, you know, he's the tough dad. And, you know, he's, he's, you know, old school and all these values and blah, blah, blah. But in reality, what he really wants is a happy household. He wants his family to find joy. He wants his kids to get along. He wants, you know, the future to be as bright and, and as possible. So being able to tact the facade, the facade down and shift to the actual narrative and desires that they want is that exact last step. So that Rogers article was actually cited by Ronnie Dietrich and he was using it as an example to talk about how Catherine Maurice's book, Let Me Hear Your Voice, actually reached a lot more people and got behavior analysis a lot more known than any data or chart or graph would have ever done. And the argument is that the data was necessary but not sufficient to tell the story. You need these other aspects in there to be able to actually disseminate. And so uh, in the article in 2018, he basically argues the best disseminator behavior analysis was actually the story by Catherine Maurice. Um, so we'll link those Couldn't in. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. I, I mean, and this is the thing goes back to conversations you and I in the past, but the idea of narratives and stories being essential to human nature. 
ending the essential social experiment that we live in. Yeah. There's a very specific reason why Joseph Campbell was able to identify the 12 cycles of the hero's journey and how those particular aspects of every uh, permeate almost every great story in the world. Not angular culture in the world from yes. the epic of Gilgamesh <laughs> yeah. to the Revolutionary War. As I say, the Gettysburg Address has components of it. You can find it exactly. everywhere, man. Rick and Morty, South yeah. Park. <laughs> There's there is something about the human experience. Ted Lasso. Craves. Yeah, abs- all of it, man. Yeah, and be that's just it. narrative is part of who we are, how we identify. Stories is where the culture is. It's the that's the underlying social thread that binds. We don't, it's very easy sometimes to get lost in the data and we're focus on the data and miss that part of the equation. You know, honestly, in real life, and that has real life consequences. There's a reason why psychologists and social workers are like, you know, mainstays, licensed, they have all this freedom to do all kinds of stuff professionally, but yet we're still begging insurance companies and schools to let us in. Narrative sucks. Because the data, and I agree, the data is critical, but if your story telling a story that touches people in that way you're dead in the water no matter how good it is okay man what do you think from a teacher's perspective because this is definitely your wheelhouse ish you're not a special ed teacher but i mean like it's definitely your 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 environment i think it's hard like unless you're in the classroom to really understand and to like get to the root of what the teacher sees as the problem like that is so personal too like i don't think that there's any way to say like walking in without really like watching and hearing to just assume, you know what I mean? Like what's going on. So I definitely feel like definitely, I mean, obviously like my fiance is a clinical psychologist. I agree with this idea of like being seen, having them identify that emotion. You know what I mean? It's like a very helpful tactic when coming in and proposing changes. And I think that when working in schools, like very personal to the teacher. That's like their domain, man. I know. Like yeah. that is their four Their walls. dojo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of teachers, like, that is what they look forward to through all four years of undergrad. That's what they plan for. I mean, they have, like, their Pinterest boards. They want to decorate their classroom. Like, they spend hours and hours and hours thinking about their decisions. You can't say that any of it is unintentional. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's cut out for sure why it's so hard like my experience that's why and that was a that's been an adjustment for me professionally three years ago i would have given a different answer in this kind of a setting it would have been the uh bull in a china shop um and uh, i made those mistakes in the past admittedly too and it's hard well, yeah learn that you don't and this is why you know uh, what what concerns me about when we release the series is gonna be like wow he always just suggests these like little nudges and he's like there's just no dro fr7 and we're going to do this SBT <laughs> program and we're going to hit the map and we're going to run through this line and the social skill like you know i just i just can imagine there's going to be like the the m- mentality interjecting itself in someone's inner monologue somewhere along the line and yep <laughs> i think i couldn't emphasize enough and we've said this a billion times but like don't need to like move mountains to be doing something, mm-hmm. especially when 99% of the problems that you see are not kid related, they're adult related. And I've always like in extreme severe behavior cases. Uh, and again, the kids are obviously engaged in the behavior. That's a problem. But it, my philosophy in general is like, and this is, should be everyone's philosophy is that you don't control people. You control the environment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So your job is to identify the critical environmental variables that are most influencing the problem and slowly over time mitigating those variables and the impact and effects that they're having. I think similar to what Abby was saying about the classroom and you you, you got your Pinterest boards and you're stoked to set everything yes. up. You come out as a behavior analyst and you're like, yo, I'm going to use every <laughs> single <laughs> DR <laughs> procedure that I learned about. I am going to make sure that this kid is on a lag schedule for his joke telling, that it is followed (laughs) perfectly. Like, you know, it's just like, it's your time to go flex your muscles in that sense too. So I think we get caught up in a similar trap. Yeah. And, and the thing is people aren't that complicated. (laughs) (laughs) Some situations are, but yeah, a lot of times, yeah, yeah. A lot of times you just don't need to. Right. But for the most part, they're not that complicated. The, the, and and again, this is probably going to be the biggest, uh, big faux pas, but like, 
the degree of precision for the time that you structure your DIR, like, oh my God, he just cut it in half and went to 15. Well, how did he know she didn't need five? I can just <laughs> hear something like, you know, yeah. man, how did I know? I didn't oh, man. I didn't know. I was in an, I was in a consultative capacity and my goal was to maximize the amount of reinforcement opportunities I could get for that kid, not to mention the amount of time away, but ensure that it was contingent and it was possible for the teacher to be able to maintain it. And then I would go back and just tweak from there and let the natural environment over time shape around the person rather than shoehorn the intervention. The thing is that the intervention should just be how you're trying to shape a person's behavior. It shouldn't be the centerpiece of what you're doing. The center, what you're actually working on is a tapestry of people and the way that they're interacting with each other. You're painting a picture. And that picture is this person's interaction with that person, this this person's interaction with the other person, how do the people around that person interacting, where are all the particular d preferred items placed around a particular room, on what interval are they would access that, what are the amounts of privileges that people have, how do they engage, what kind of corrective procedures are in their place. Like, you're looking at a whole giant tapestry of interconnected contingencies, plural, and if you are hyper focused on the singular contingency that you're trying to interject, you're losing the forest for the trees and you're not seeing what you need to be seeing. And it's and that's where the big picture side of what we do comes into play. And I think that's where maturity and clinical judgment and actually knowing what you're talking about starts factoring itself in and it starts becoming apparent over time. I was going to build off that and say that when when Ryan cited his his reference, it we went through those points part of that is has to be credible feedback a credible source and when you're entering the situation you are not a credible source every time so nudges are opportunities for small contacts of reinforcement for the teacher as well so that you're able to go in and do some more nuanced things as you start gaining that credibility I, that's i love that that's a great point and that's they are their micro opportunities to establish successes which inherently create your credibility yes what were you going to say, Abby? Um, I wanted to go back to something that you were saying. I forget what you said, but then it prompted me to think more about to like, oh, that the behavior is rooted in the context and the environment. And I think what's really hard with teaching is if you're not coming in with, and a lot of teachers are very reflective. So I don't want to say that teachers aren't coming in with a reflective attitude. They are. But um, I think it's even hard for me. And I feel like I'm very well trained in behavior analysis, very well trained in teaching um, when I have a problem with the student to, if it's not an immediate fix, to step back and be like, okay, what do I need to change in my behavior? And if you're not careful, that can turn into very like negative self-talk um, when there's no reason that it should be. It's just you. And you know what I mean? Like, and I think as I think about it with myself, because I feel like if I am having a hard time remembering that I am also a product of my environment, how can a teacher with no training, you know what I mean? Be given this feedback of like, you are the environment that we need to change for this behavior. Um, like that's just, it's so tricky. Yeah. The, the talk, talk that we had in the, the talk that we had where it's like, always whenever i'm talking to a teacher especially and again this is not a not a a a, a, a bashing them i, I mean i really yeah. do think these dedicated public servants I'm really insecure at times about what they got going on because they're they live in a state of continuous chaos and they do put a lot of thought into what's going on and they do care a lot and they are yep. careful and intentional and it backfires a lot yeah and when you contact that much failure in the face of your best intentions, yeah. it, it's going to beat you up and make you feel insecure about stuff. So, And then and, we talk about such a huge, <clears throat> huge shift in behavior with the pandemic. So we have these teachers who have had so much success, who have shaped their practice over decades and then are being met with this like complete phase change line of behavior because of the pandemic and all of a sudden these new they have to like adapt and that's really hard when you've been keeping your practice over decades yeah for sure you, you've developed a routine you have a, yeah. a process um and that's why i think it's so important that when you go in you have to see them as a colleague even though you're from different disciplines you're talking to another professional you're not talking to a person you're there to treat or help yeah like you can't address it necessarily like they are your clients exactly like it, yeah yeah so and 
for me, it's I, I've found that you sincerely approach them as like, look, I'm not here to tell you what to do. It's your room. I respect that. I think that we both agree it's not going great. I do have some suggestions. To be honest, some of them are going to sound like I'm, I might be criticizing you, and I promise you I'm not. It's just I'm able to, like a fly on the wall, see some things that you can't see. If you disagree with anything I got going on or you don't think I'm right, I'm please, I'm, I, I'm willing. You tell me I'm wrong, and we can move on. And if, if you go in that, I don't want to say non-committal attitude, but like the willingness to not not overly exert authority into the situation and like force someone to do something they uh, you it's a much easier sell done both and i can tell you the greatest degree of resistance and when you exert the greatest degree of in your grip trying to do these things where if you treat them like a baby bird and you hold them with a a certain degree of softness um they're more responsive and i feel like too i mean just adding in the contingency of the teachers like I am responsible for nobody underneath me. I am always being told what to do. There is no, like, there is no lot, like, there's not a lot of collaboration. It's my admin telling me what to do. It's the district telling me what to do. It's the district professionals coming in and observing and telling me what to do. So I feel like teachers, I mean, at minimum are being observed at least once a week by somebody that they barely know being given suggestions. They are getting constant emails being given suggestions. It is a field full of fix this. And I think that's where the defensiveness comes in because you are just another person. Great point. They seem to only get attention when they're doing shit wrong. Exactly. You know, no one ever catches them being good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, There's no four to one ratio. Yeah. 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 It's uh, and it's, and because of so many kids, you know, it's not, they're not working one on, they might have a, you know, a BCBA might have a 20 kid caseload. Okay, sure. but they're operating with each one of those kids as an individual and in individualized context. A teacher with the same twenty-person caseload is operating them in in a singular dynamic environment where they're all interacting with each other, and not to mention all the parents are intertwined as well as a result because they're getting all the reports of all these particular interactions, which is creating like a a whole different kind of crowd control we actually don't deal with in our practices yes. at all. And crowd control. Yeah. I mean, if you've ever tried to organize more than two people to do anything, you you should know <laughs> that it's chaos. And you very often blame for stuff that you couldn't even possibly have imagined was your fault. But somehow, group thing kicks in and it self rationalizes itself that you are the problem. Um, and that's a, and that's a really like, unfair like, thing that teachers deal with. Yeah, and I I feel like behavior analysts when we look at it and we say. Like, I'm not going to say that we would say you are the problem, but we're looking at the context and we're saying, here are the things that you can tweak in order to make it better, right? But a district comes in and it is, you are the problem. You did something wrong. There is no like, fix it for the next time. It's just, you did a bad job. Like, it's not that future forward thinking of what's next. And I think, I think when we talk about why do behavior analysts have such issues with teachers, I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, you know what the coaching one thing that i've noticed in education too with the coaching is another thing too where it's like a it's just a cultural differential right we go in and we do coaching with rbts at our scheduled five percent time whatever it is it's one-on-one it's individualized feedback it's procedurally driven it's it's yeah. it's explicit you know it's it's very clear right it's it's that person should know exactly what they're supposed to be doing the way they're supposed to be doing it and it's ongoing and it's there's a standard in terms of practice in that regard flip side teachers are getting divergent points of view from everyone there's no explicit standardized point of practice and they're just expected to be good teachers and know how to teach because no one should have to teach them how to teach <laughs> yep that's the attitude you know from an administrative perspective a lot and that's a really i personally think it's ridiculous but aside from it being ridiculous i think it sets people up to be in an adversarial environment and dynamic with each other rather than this problem solving collaborative mindset that I think that we bring to the table a lot and it's very easy to discount how much impact that has on a person's capacity to accept feedback and ability to like participate in any kind of process because it's a constant barrage of you should already know you should already know you should already know when the learning never was even happened to begin with it's not recognizing that you know teaching just like anything else is a skill Skills require 
ongoing opportunities to not just learn them, but to practice them, to get the corrective feedback, to go back and practice them again differently ha- and have like a natural growth cycle. And they don't get the don't get the leniency that comes of, a, of that learners get. They just get they're just expected to be ready out the oven to go ready out the gate. I think too, like any BCBA going in, will be able to tell a lot of how the teacher will respond based off of the culture of the school. Do we hit that <laughs> point of the podcast again where we're like, oh, darn. We talk- no, no, I don't <laughs> think so. I don't think so. It, Cause it's, listen, we've talked about education a ton in this and we've had a lot of educational scenarios and we've all had the luxury being behavior analysts who have worked in educational and clinical settings. At least I, I know that I've had, actually we all had different yeah. situ- opportunities to do that. So we can have a really sincere and authentic comparison of those two environments. And I, I mean, working in the clinic is everything's got its challenges working in a clinic's got its challenges it's but on a precision the amount of control the amount of just tactical decision making that you can make that are just pure and clean are mountains continents away planets away from the way it's like in education education is just messy and learning how to operate get results in a messy environment Um, It's a challenge. I will say this. I think it makes you better in looking at bigger pictures and having to just find your moment rather than relying on the perfection of precision to to substantiate the work that you're doing. And um, I think in long term, that makes it more sustainable for you as a professional to avoiding burnout. And um, I think it also just makes you better and more effective over time. But maybe I'm just being biased towards myself here. I'm just like trying to justify my own life reality. The way that I feel very unprepared to teach 60 kids is how I imagine a lot of teachers coming in without a behavior analytic background and training when they come into just general education teaching. And I think that there's a lot of um, BCBAs who go in and are put in this position of trying to give advice to teachers without really understanding how complex the situation is. I mean, if you've got a BCBA who comes in as and comes from a more clinical background coming into a school setting. I mean, most clinical backgrounds, you're going to have a one-on-one RBT. um, And there's just so many different contextual variables that um, it's definitely, you definitely want to make sure that you come in and uh, speak in the same language as the teacher and really understanding the resources that are available. um, Yeah, man, they're human beings. In the context. They're all people, dude. It's just, you got to be more of a person. You can't be. Yeah. You got to learn the vernacular. You know, one thing that my dissertation advisor emphasized and a big challenge for me that why well, I probably had to rewrite my dis eight times before I got it right um, was, you know, the hyper technical speech that you see a lot of people doing. And she always she's she always highlighted to me. It's like, listen, until you can say this in English, you don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was a very difficult lesson for me to learn because I always pride of myself and being able to, you know, keep it clean and, and speak technological ways. In reality, now I see the point and I totally agree with it, is that like you really don't start understanding these concepts fit into actual everyday experience that we all have until you can just talk about them normal. You need both skill sets, right? Yeah. I mean you need it for academic settings, you need it for technical settings, you need it for maybe clinical opportunities. But I think that in terms of a, a forming a a complete conceptual understanding of what you're doing. If you can't, that, that is, that's always the missing piece, not the other way around. School teaches you and forces you the others. Yeah. The other thing and is I think the- you have to, sorry, I think you have yeah. to be able to do it quick too. I mean, there's been a lot of times where I've been trying to give advice to some of my teacher friends and I've just realized how absolutely unprepared I was to try and describe a protocol that I was familiar with and try to do it in this like minute lunch break that we kind of have that's now 15 minutes and be like what I think you should actually do is increase your like positive statements and just trying to you know what I mean like provide that very succinctly very quickly yeah a lot of the answer in school is just be nice to kids which is unfortunate but (laughs) just be nice what else we want to talk about what else other what other component of it were you guys hoping that I would pick up on I think there were some peer response things that I was looking at, both with uh, Jarrett and with one peer in particular that she was targeting in the classroom. Um, Sally. 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 Yeah. I said Sophia. It's okay, Sally. Close. I mean, it, that almost forced the hands of dads because it was kind of, it, it progressed to a point where Jarrett was old enough to start 
having that back. strong sense of justice and fighting back and it was leading to bigger bigger blow-ups and, and increased intensity and part of your conversation about uh lily was about jared and the things that we were doing for him and and how we could address that as well which i think is it's a big piece you come in looking at one kid but there's lots of players in the game and having a willing audience for a disruptive kid can also be a pretty tough tough thing to address you know that point is interesting because it really and i've been using the word dynamic in our discussions a lot but we really haven't talked about the idea of static versus dynamic behavior and common behavior analytic practice focuses on an idea of static behavior it focuses on instances We've talked about these T plus one, these T one, T two, T three scenarios, but I mean the way that the three term contingency, for example, teaches a person to think about instances of behavior really does put it almost like in its own little bubble of a moment in time. This thing happens, and all I need to look at is the thing that happened before and the thing that happened after. Now, if I get ABCs. enough of these things in sequence, I can establish enough of a pattern speculate on a hypothetical reason the behavior is happening the way that it's happening and that kind of a linear static view of behavior really limits your ability to see all the interlocking contingencies all the interwoven expectations all the various things that we've been focusing on pushing this holistic mindset this holistic approach this contextual analysis that we want to promote here um, based on this idea of non-linearity, right? Because the other way to look at it is that behavior is dynamic and that it's that stream of water, ever vet, like always flowing in time, nonstop. And not only that, but it's crashing against the walls and the boulders and it's, it's being redirected by the stream by some beavers who built a dam. And, you know, it's just, it's constantly in flux and motion relative to changes. And it's a dynamic agent in the world um, and viewing behavior like that is difficult because, and this is actually where some context of behavior matter, you start, you, you, you stop seeing it simply as a one-way road person out. You start seeing as that bi-directionality that Skinner talked about in verbal behavior, right? Where verbal behavior is bi-directional. It means it moves up and downstream. It goes both ways. And that usually means that you have to factor in how other people are acting, how other people are, how it's influencing them and how one response is in fact affecting them and how their response to that is affecting the other person back and how that creates this tit for tat scenario that we kind of talked about when we were talking about game theory and all that other stuff in previous episodes. So I prefer dynamic view of behavior just because I think it's the more realistic in placing people in the environment and trying to understand what's going on. And um, I think that it's a necessary component to solving social problems. Because if you have a social, this was a social problem. It was a poor interaction with other people because she wanted what she wanted. And that was creating this social problem that needed to be dealt with. That view of behavior also allows, allows potentially for a, a prettier outlook as opposed to a, this is a one direction. We are just getting worse and worse and worse or, or, or wherever it could go. You know what I mean? It, it, it allows for... I don't know. There's so many <laughs> ingrained pieces within your stream metaphor about how many teachers are getting eroded by behavior right now. I'm trying but to I mean, think about it. That's literally no, it's true. It is, right. It's erosion. And sometimes, sometimes the rock pushes the water. Sometimes the water works its way and <laughs> wears that stone down. Yeah. But when you're looking at how, you know, not only is it, we're just going downstream. It's, there's the potential for going back to brighter times or those points of comparison that we draw when you're in those darker times. I agree. And I think, and and just to take it one step further, like I think that also would help a lot in some of the conversations we have where they do kind of deteriorate into like just moralization, you know, because I, I, we do see a lot of like posturing and moralization about what we do. The reality is, is that that's a pretty vapid and empty kind of point of perspective if you're not factoring in how it influences other people, especially like, let's just take severe cases, for example, severe cases. It's not just about the person who has a severe behavior. It's about the ancillary people around them who are suffering and who love this person. Those people's parents matter. Their lives matters just as much as that person's do. And they're being impacted of it just as much, if not worse, because especially if we're talking about cognitive capacity, they're self-aware of the judgment, of the ostracization, of the isolation, of like they're suffering in a very conscious way, not in a moralistic, you know, sense of suffering 
or even like just physical suffering. So like that emotional torment matters. And if you don't consider it as a variable in the way that you're analyzing a situation, you're looking to structure things to repair those relationships and seeing part of your job isn't just, you know, quote unquote, making sure this person can, you know, get what they need when they need to do it, but repairing a relationship to create a functioning social environment again, how that requires compromise on everyone's point, especially that person as well, where they can't have everything they want all the time because limits are normal and natural parts of living and cooperating in a, in a, in a social system. Um, it, it, it does change the way you kind of view things and approach things and maybe would soften some people's approaches and, and points of view in terms of how absolutist they think about this stuff. That's, that's my biggest complaint. My biggest complaint is the absolutism a lot of people approach these problems with and wanting to deny how the impact of these kinds of things have, the impact that these kind of things have on the outside players or the ancillary players that are also involved in this person's life, that they matter too. Yeah. Could we add some recommendations for people who are more interested in a nonlinear view of behavior analysis instead of the three-term sure. contingency or four-term? Gold Diamond's work is yeah, one of them. Blue Books, yeah. Yeah, the Blue Books are really cool. They redid that he, uh, with Joe Lang as the author with a few others that we'll have to make sure that's in there. Um, yeah. Cantor's work is an absolute beast. <laughs> you meets, cannot, yeah, you can't get meets, on a podcast and recommend Cantor. Like, but, it, but it meets, it does meet the dynamic sort of nonlinear. No, it speaking. does. But like, holy, <laughs> you can't just be like, go read Cantor. Yeah, no, but yeah, no, I'm cool. not saying go read it, but I mean, there's someone out the there people. that's going to be like, I'm yes. so glad you mentioned that. <laughs> it's going to be one person in the lifetime of this no, episode. No, you do. You have to get it in there, but like, yeah. Yeah, but Cantor, Cantor but I, why don't you talk about why they're interesting though? Like Cantor is interesting because he brings in the idea of field theory to a behavior analytic model, right? So he takes a contingency and he builds around like a gravitational variable almost or and his field. his his field literally and he literally included like in his diagram of his conceptual model which is nowhere near a three-term contingency it's like 20 plus <laughs> it included the other behavioral segments purposely to show you that what you're looking at is in this dynamic uh model which was stuff that didn't really make sense but man i wish that was introduced earlier go ahead Abby. yeah I, wait, wait, wait. I, those are go ahead sorry no, sorry. I just have to say also that um, Doug Greer's work, like of the learn unit in context and the egg and all of that is based off of Cantor, but using it in a bit more practical, digestible way too. I'm embarrassed that I forgot to bring that one up, but I'm glad that you did okay. too. Yeah, you're the <laughs> one with all the experience with Greer. Yeah, his learn unit is literally built in that way. Yes. And those are really good conceptual models. What I would say is that they fail in quantitative scrutiny. So if we want more, want some quantitative models, I think that you sh you can look at multi-leveled analyses out of BOM. You look at molar and micro distinctions um, of analysis and, and try to look at those philosophical perspectives as well. You can look at Racklin's teleological behaviorism in terms of looking at causes of behavior and where do you start. Um, and those lead into things like discounting and lead into other quantitative models that Ha, have been substantiated in terms of predicting outcomes and behavior. But yeah, I agree that conceptually looking at like Cantor, all that stuff, it's very important. And the nonlinear approach of Cole Diamond is fantastic. Yeah, the blue books are, every practitioner in, early in their career should read them. We should replace the white book with the blue books. I keep hoping someday that they'll rediscover the other ones that were supposed to be written. <laughs> yeah, the white book is, I mean, the white book is, this is controversial. The white book is a great introductory textbook, but that's what it is. It's an introductory textbook. It's not, in my opinion, a graduate level textbook. It was my undergraduate, it was my undergraduate ABA textbook. Like the entire semester in undergraduate, we had to cover the third version. And then okay. right. I was reintroduced to it at uh, grad school. And I was like, wait, we already read this. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, it's it's pretty wild. The blue books are much more at least master's level reads. Especially chapter eight. <laughs> I don't remember which one that is. So, but. it's the one that's eight hundred pages long. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that one! It's the last one. They are long. They're like it's they're long. <laughs> they're super long. If you're earning BACBCUs, your code word is nonlinear behavior analysis. Again, if you're earning BACBCUs, your code word is nonlinear behavior analysis. Just head over to our website. It's a quick process. You verify that you've listened to the episode and then it's sent to your inbox. Again, 
Your code word is nonlinear behavior analysis. The views expressed during the explanatory fiction podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not reflect the official policy or position of any other agency, organization, employer, or company. Assumptions made in the analysis are not reflective of any position of any other entity other than the authors. And since we are critically thinking human beings, these views are always subject to revision, change, and rethinking at any time. Please do not hold us to them in perpetuity. This podcast is to educate and inform, provide discussion, and does not constitute professional advice. Remember again that the variables in this case were randomly generated as well as the name and the episode imagery. Thank you math, thank you science, and thank you artificial intelligence. Rhino LLC is an approved continuing education provider that is ACE number hashtag OP-19-3037 and the Behavior Analyst Certification Board, also known as the BACB, a registered trademark, does not sponsor or approve or endorse Ryan O LLC, the materials, information, or sessions identified herein. Thank you for listening.